Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Help with Natalie Cuomo. And we start too abruptly, I think. No, that's I think fine. I, yeah, I think I I'm ready. You. I didn't know. The, I, I know. assume it's recording it's always, the moment I, I walk know, in. I know. I know. So I'm, I'm on we game. We got some good stuff in the I I am here with amazing comedian Gian Marco Sarezi. How are you? Very good. How are you? Good. I I actually have so much to talk to you about. Sure. Well, I was you know watching your sets, doing some d- deep diving. I noticed diving. there was another view today. Yes. <laughs> We have so much in common. My, we do. My Acting. mom's Jewish. My dad's Italian. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Really, it's the same sides as yeah. well. Yeah. But you're like, were you? Where were you raised? Queens. Queens. Mm-hmm. So you have real Italian. Yeah. Like mine's all fake. Really. I mean, my dad like pretended. Like he he made me. He really raised me as he, he told me I was a hundred percent Italian when I was at the age <laughs> where I couldn't understand how fraction wise that was impossible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and. And I've never done a DNA test because I'm scared as to just how little it is. Because if it's nothing, <laughs> how do I address that? Then my name is a lie. Your whole life was. Yeah. And so he told me, so everything I know about being Italian, like he had like a Sorezi sauce and I thought it was like a family sauce, but it was just like ragu with like butter <laughs> added. And it's delicious. I like his attempts. Yeah, yeah. It's a but crazy it, sauce. I feel like I'm a little bit of a fraud and people think I'm Italian before I'm Jewish. See, I feel that way about being Jewish because my mom's Jewish and we celebrate everything, but I never got a bar mitzvah. Did you do birthright? No. See, I got a, I got a speed bar mitzvah. I didn't do bar mitzvah either, but at birthright, they brought us to the Western Wall <laughs> and they did the the important part, which was just getting picked up in a chair. That's really all I wanted to do. I want that so badly. Sure. Yes, you did do it. I, I could. I think at my next my next out of town show. It's gonna be Israel? It's gonna be or you're gonna have the picked audience. up in a chair. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a closer yeah. to the audience. <laughs> yes. Good. That's great. <laughs> the last show on the road that I did was in Charleston and an audience member. He came up to uh, me between shows and said, you know, they said it would be fine if I chugged the club's hot sauce as a, I did a shot of it during the show. So if you want to do that, I'm down. Wait, okay. Let me understand this. A random audience member <laughs> came up to you and you're hoping, oh, maybe they'll buy some merch or something. And they said, I asked the club if I could chug the hot sauce. And he took a shot. So yeah, at the end, Dan and I went up together and he took a shot. Just to show just, off? I don't know why. Uh, not even on the stage. What kind of hot sauce? Like Tabasco or like, like the really hot sauce? The club had hot sauce. So I don't know how hot it is. The club had hot it's sauce? Their own, yeah. What club is it? It was um, the Sparrow in Charleston. Oh. was yeah. it? Did you try it? Was it hot? I did hot not sauce? try it. You know what? I should have. Maybe it, this was all like bullshit. I'm saying like if you had like a shot of Tabasco, it's like, I wouldn't call it impressive. I'd go, yeah. well, <laughs> you, did, you did that. Yeah. You did that. You were, you're not supposed to do with it. I feel like I put two shots of Tabasco on everything I eat. I'm a big so. Tabasco. I think I realized once I was like, oh, it's because there's salt in it too. <sighs> like I didn't realize, like, I thought I just like spicy. It's like, no, this is the only seasoning I have. <laughs> but I put Tabasco on a lot. <laughs> but it's nothing. Tabasco is not real. Right. If you re- I sometimes get the other hot sauces and that's- Where? Brutal. There was one, I forgot what it was, but someone sent it to me and I tried it. It was hell. It was mm-hmm. it was one that's like known for that. Oh my God. I, my, I had the ice cream ready. Yeah. I only put a little on a cracker and I couldn't feel my face. I would do it with a friend. I would do a ghost pepper. Yeah. I've done, I did a, a sketch once where I was supposed to be eating spicy stuff and I was very method. So I was like, I'm going to eat a lot of spicy hot sauces. Yeah. And it was brutal. I had a loaf of bread, gallon of milk. And I was sick for two days. It was awful. Oh. But I'd do it again. A loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. If it's being filmed, I'll do almost anything. <laughs> so you are a trained actor. Yeah, I I think I'm not a good actor. I don't, that's not true. Uh, f- like, what, what do you, you've never seen my work? What do you see my one line in Hustlers? Well, yeah, I think I did okay with that one. I, I, I train, I'm definitely a trained actor. I feel like you can see your acting background because you're, you got a good stage presence. You're very physical. You. Yeah, I think that's all I have though. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't Projection. know. I've, after not, after not booking like acting work for, for as long as it's been, sometimes I go like, oh yeah, that wasn't, I was a charismatic. There was something, Yeah, but like, I just, I think about the days I tried Shakespeare and the days I tried those intense roles. And once in a while, I'd catch a glimmer of, of greatness, Yeah, but it wasn't constant. Were, were you, were you a great actor? No, that's why I'm doing stand up. 
No, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> no, but I mean, but like, but that's do, what made me go go to stand up originally. Is I was like, I I is like completely giving up, and then being like, all right, I need to pivot. But w- when you were an actor, did you go like, oh, I'm gonna be Lady Macbeth someday? I'm gonna like, did you have those dreams? I I wanted to be on Broadway. I wanted to be like the star of a musical. I really? Wanted to be thoroughly modern Millie. Could you, did you have the pipes for it? Well, when I, so when I was like in middle school and like high school, I was like the lead in all like the school plays, not high school, sure. middle school and stuff. So I thought I did when I watched back, I'm like, but yeah, I, I mean, middle school, the bar's <laughs> a lot lower. No, no, no. You I know. think it's Oliver in, nine, in the first year. Okay. okay. It's really, everyone knows, cause you're in, you're in, you're in college, you're in high school. And I remember <laughs> when I was a freshman, there was like the star. Yeah. of my high school. And they're like, she's going to go to college and find out uh, you want to be a big fish in little pond, right. that little blah, blah, blah. And, and part of me always was like, oh, I'm going to work so hard. That won't happen to me. I will go to college. I will dominate. Yeah. Sure enough, you go to college and it's every lead from their high school kid. I know. And, and, and suddenly you're in the ensemble and you're like, what happened? <laughs> what I, happened? I was going to major in theater in college, I, but uh, I wound up majoring in environmental science. My acting teacher told me my heart wasn't in it. In high school? In college. And, and I was just how did like, you take it? I bad. I was like, all right, I give up. <laughs> well, that's a good point. Because we always had the we had like a, like an older actor come to the class for a master class and he says the thing. He's like, if you can do anything else, do it. Yeah. And obviously, ideally, half the room would have been like, Thank you. I'm going to stop paying 50000 a year for this degree. But everyone in their head was like, me, I'm, I'm the one, I'm the exception. And in my small conservatory, which people dropped out until it was only 11, I think only like three of us are still like performing, performing. Yeah. And uh, just a waste of money. It's good you did a different degree. I, I mean, don't know. I to, College is a mess. College is, is stupid. For this, for this profession, yeah. you just got to go in. Because I found out stand-up comedy because I did uh, a play where I talked to the audience and all the positive feedback oh, was for the talking to the audience part. None of the positive feedback was for the acting part. <laughs> and eventually, even as stubborn as I am, I go, okay, do this. Yeah. And I should have, that process that happened at 25, 26, 27 should have happened 17, 18, 19. Yeah, but you still did a time, uh, time step in your late night set. I did, yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, I try to use it. I saw that and I was like. As a, that was a $200,000 time step that I did. I love tap. I took tap all throughout high school. I'd go every fucking Wednesday to this random tap class. Yeah. I just love, I don't dance, but I love tap dancing. Were you good? Do it again. I think I am still, I am good at tap. How many stand-up comedians do a little, I mean, other than me, <laughs> what other stand-up comedians? I have one other bit that has a, a tap thing in it and they're both, I do a, a triple ball time step. What yeah. is that, I think that's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I need to figure out one more move so I can very, make the jokes a little bit different. Oh, and, uh, I can show you afterwards. <laughs> sure. I mean, you do a little shuffle off the, the shuffle off to Buffalo. That's fun. <sighs> The problem is like, it's not, no, it's not, it's not big, impressive. No, no, it's cool. For me, I want it to be a workout at the same time and tap like, oh. you know, there's some, there's some like Babe Ruth's in tap dance, like people who are not like, I want to work out at the same time. I want to yeah. kill two birds with one stone. I see. And that. that's why I never got too deep in the tap because it was just like, well, now I still got to work out. I think that's why I like it. I hate working out so much. Yeah. I, I really struggle with working out. I, I, my weight loss method has always been anorexia. <laughs> But now that I'm in a happy relationship, I mean, I'm getting fatter. Hey, that that's the natural course of relationships. <laughs> this was too honest. <laughs> when, when people get back in shape, you can tell someone's like they're gearing someone's up for back. the breakup. They're like, let me let me get back. We you know let's let's consider our options. Let's see what's out there. Uh, have you tried uh, getting? St- I get a little stoned before workouts now. Yeah, just a little. Two point five mg. And that makes it less boring. I get bored for sure. Yeah, I definitely, so I definitely work out. I've been like running. I I definitely smoke weed before, like take an edible. Sure. I feel like that's the best because then it hits you in the middle and you get like a second wind of yeah of high. But it's still, I re, I'm really trying to be better with it. Like- we skip past the anorexia completely. Oh yeah, was that is that a, was that a was that a real phase? Um, I feel like at phases of my life, yeah. For sure. I, but I, sure. I don't know if I've ever spoken to a woman that hasn't deeply struggled with. Ariella Lies weight. has her great bit about body dysmorphia. It's a condition <laughs> where you're a woman. Yeah. Because um, my mom was bulimic. Uh, 
before I was before I was born, she and my dad got divorced, but she always credits my dad as the the person who helped her through bulimia. He's very stubborn. And I think it's like the one, the one quality he can have where he can be like, he can try to fix someone in a way where you shouldn't be fixing people. Yeah. But if they're bulimic, they might need the help. Yeah. And uh, she's always had body stuff that I think she gave to me. She always tells me a story. She was on the Stairmaster. She had a Stairmaster in, mm-hmm. in like the bedroom or the ba- or the attic or whatever. And she was complaining as she always does how she didn't get a chance to work out that day. And she claims, I don't remember this, but when I was a kid and I was a little chubby that she, that I started crying and I was like, you are skinny, you're skinny enough. And I like felt bad at her complaining about her weight huh. to me at a very young age. And I think, I think that's, that must've stuck with me. Tova said they're called Almond moms. Have you ever heard this term? No. When when the kids, I think I'm getting it right. It's a TikTok thing. When the kids come over, these are the moms who are like, are you kids hungry? You want some almonds? <laughs> and I'm like, that is, that was my mom to a degree. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, she didn't like, she never like, she didn't like call me fat. Right. Or anything like that. But I think I just, I took, saw how she dealt with her neuroses and I took on those neuroses and she always claims because she was she was uh, heavier in in high school, and I think she went through some kind of phase bulimia. <laughs> I don't know. She went through a <laughs> mental <laughs> illness, and she says she's she started losing weight, but she resented in a in a weird way. She resented all the attention she got from men after she lost the weight mm. because she could see so transparently that it was just because of this. Yeah, and I don't think she ever resolved it, but. She had that. It is, yeah. It is difficult to realize people treat you completely different based on yeah, how you look. I knew a lot of, uh, what is it called? Aerobic anorexic. What's that? It's, it's, it was, I don't know if that's the right term, uh, but let's play fast and loose with eating disorders. One of the few times Instagram posts has ever been taken off because I said the word eating disorder, anorexia. Like really? it's, it's very sensitive to, to that. Interesting. Um, but it's like, it's when you basically, I believe you do so much cardio, like four hours of cardio a day. Yeah. And I remember, I remember growing up some, oh. some girls in my, one in middle, one in high school, one in college were like, would do the elliptical for like three, oh, it was always on the elliptical. Wow. That's cr- so boring. It is so boring. It is so boring. And probably it tapped into something too of just like repetition. Yeah. And it wasn't like going hard. It wasn't like they were training. It was just like constant. And uh, that's what I aspire to now. I definitely feel like I've had bouts in my life where I've been like something didn't go right. And then I've been like, all right, I'm I'm just going to not really eat. And I feel people like, I think maybe the last time was like maybe a year or so ago. People, a lot of people were like, we thought you were on drugs. And I'm like, oh no, I'm just... (laughs) Self-control. Yeah, I don't think I ever could. I just, I I couldn't not, the pain I feel from not eating. I've never, I've never hit that next point of like, it's more stable. I just don't think I ever could. For me, I feel like food is like one of the things that makes me happy. So it's like, not like, when you're sad, you're like, I don't even want something that's going to make me happy, whatever. I don't need to eat my favorite meal. But like, if you're in a good place every day is like, what's the best thing I can eat today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of feel like I food, I love food. It's a weird love-hate relationship. It's not resolved. Yeah. Yeah. We both clearly have issues when yeah. it comes to this. But you're you're in a better place now because oh. of the relationship. Duh. Yeah, we're yeah. doing great. We're great. Yeah. But your boyfriend lost a lot of weight. He did. He lost an, an insane amount of weight from running, getting stoned and running. Sure. He's doing, what is he doing? A hundred miles this Saturday miles. that yes, I just see? Yes, he is. Uh, is there any part of you, because I see it and there is a part of me that goes, oh, it's a little too much running. <laughs> <laughs> there's no doubt. There's no doubt that there's a party. Whenever someone does a lot of something, there's a part of me that goes, oh, wow, that's a lot. That's a yeah. hundred miles. Why? Get in a car. So I watched like, this is like the prep for the race. So we've been watching like documentaries and stuff. I watched this one last night with him called The Why. Uh-huh. So I think that is something <laughs> that like goes through their mind when they're like running. They're like, why am I doing this? I, I don't. I, I ran today one mile and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I've never, and I just walked. <laughs> does he listen to music? For, for the races, you don't. I cannot imagine. Yeah. I cannot imagine yeah. the boredom, yeah. the boredom I would feel. 
I, I mean, it's really bad. I think I have ADD uh, and I feel like it's getting worse, but like if I have to go for it, sometimes I'll do like a CrossFit class and I'll have us run around the block and I'll try to sneak on my headphones for that two minute run yeah. because something about it bores me so deeply. I feel like it also music motivates you so much when you're running. Like yeah, I yeah, feel yeah. that. I'll do podcasts too. It's just, I get bored. Yeah, I get bored too. A hundred, I would, I would have to be listening to an audio book or listening to like all of Seinfeld. I mean- I feel like, so they don't complain about boredom. That's just like the pain that your body is in. Like, I feel like these types of people, they like, they are able to just like go into some like flow state. I used to like it must be a mix of people who really do love it and feel like they just love to do this and a mix of people where you're like, something's up. <laughs> something's not right. I mean, whenever you're in the extremes of anything, yeah. you're going to have a mix. Yes. So, uh, well, now with that, he's, what's the longest he's run before? 55. And when he's done with that, is he need to stay home for a day and like lie in bed? Yeah. Yeah. He's like very, his eyes are like bloodshot. He's like, ex- he can't, he's got blisters everywhere. And then do you take care of him? Like, is that like a, yeah. do you enjoy that? That do, do, like, like the do, nurturing do, element? Yes. I definitely am a nurturing person. Yeah. Did you ever see uh, Phantom Thread? It was Daniel Day-Lewis movie. No, I didn't. He's like a famous designer and he's a workaholic and he basically gets poisoned from some mushrooms, but I think by accident the first time. And uh, she takes care of him. And it's like this one moment where the relationship works. Yeah. And then eventually he starts working again. Their relationship goes to shit. And he basically, she basically poisons him, but he knows, he realizes as he takes the, this big spoiler alert, he realizes <laughs> as he's taking the bite, oh, you're poisoning me. And then he still takes the bite because he's like, this is the dynamic that they yeah. they need or crave. And it's brutal. It's it's toxic and horrible, but some it's, people like it. Yeah, yeah. Some people like it. I mean, men used to go to war and now they just run a hundred miles. <laughs> so. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, it's funny because when you watch the documentaries, you're like, what am I going to expect these people to look like at the end? They look completely, you wouldn't guess that they had just done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think maybe that's like them putting something on for a camera. I just. And are they all rail thin? No. And a lot of them are like in their 40s. That seems to be like really? the, the age for ultra running. I also can't imagine my body. Like I've always, I don't really want to do a marathon other than to just like do it. Yeah. But I just imagine something, I'm a lanky guy, something would get injured in the training process. A hundred miles, forget about it. Yeah. Forget about it. Uh, I feel like, so I I think signing up for a half marathon, I'm going to do that because I feel like that's going to be the thing that's going to make me work out. Like yeah. if I'm like, I have to do this because otherwise I'll embarrass myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I feel like you kind of hold yourself to a goal that way. Yeah, I just have always had, there's always some imagined version of what I want to look like that keeps me going. When I was, I mean, I was, I wasn't, to say I was a fat kid would be wrong, but I was like, I was, I had uh, like bigger boobs. Yeah. And so I would always wear the towel uh, up here and, and people would make jokes like that's how women wear their towels. And I always just felt so self, it was just like here. And I always like fantasized about every summer I'd be like, I'm going to get a six pack. And it was with, it was so dumb because it was without any of, it wasn't like I'm going to get in shape. Yeah. It was like, I'm somehow going to get a six pack here. And I would do the eight minute abs video. And they said like, do this every day and you'll have a six pack. And it's like, it's an eight minute light, they light lied. ab workout. They lied. And I, I swore, because in my mind, I, I really had this belief I had a friend uh, who was a soccer kid. He was in shape. Like he had a six pack for mm-hmm. forever. He was just a soccer kid, good genes. And and I think he was also charming and handsome. And so he, all the girls liked him. And I always, in my mind, I was like, once I get in shape, I will get girls easily. They will like me. And then I got, the more I got in shape in life, the more I realized like, no, it's my personality. <laughs> <laughs> like it is, it is a deep understanding of like, sure, this might grease the wheel once in a while, but it's not, it's not that. It's not the one-to-one. Yeah. I feel like, well, do you work out a lot? 
all every day. Yeah. How did yeah. you motivate yourself to? I, I find that working out is so boring. It is. It is. I did P90X in college, and that was like cool because I I definitely latch on to like oh 90 days, and it's a system, and it's a yes. thing, and you do it, and you talk to other people about it. And then I was in a relationship. I was in Philly. And I wanted to try every cheesesteak in Philly. So it kind of went away <laughs> and uh, in a relationship and all those things. And then uh, God, we're, we're going to have to add a trigger warning for anyone with eating disorders. But yeah. but uh, <laughs> I, I had a roommate um, who's a friend from college and, and he was gay. And I, I like walk around in my underwear a lot. I'm just deep at heart. I think I'm a, a nudist or borderline. And I was walking around in my underwear and I said to him, like, I'm in good shape, right? And he wouldn't answer me. And I don't think he was being cruel. Yeah. I think he is uh, very honest to the point yeah. that he, that, you know, he can be an asshole to a certain degree, but he wasn't going to lie to me. He's not a liar. He's not a liar. And, and I was, again, I wasn't fine. I was yeah. fine, but like, he didn't say anything. And I, I went to my room and I like wept. I <laughs> wept and I wept because yeah. it, it, I, I didn't ask him, uh, am I healthy? I didn't ask him this. I asked a gay man, I'm in good shape, right? And he at least let me know what the truth was to what my vision was. Now I could go, okay, I'm gonna be okay with whatever I am. But but he he brought me back to earth. And and then from there I just like I did CrossFit for a little and I did yoga for a little. I did hip hop and 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 then I remember your hip hop videos. Yeah. They are good. Oh my Pre-COVID. god. Pre-COVID. COVID just stopped it. Wow, and, fuck COVID. You yeah. used to post hip hop videos. I did. Oh my God. Those were so good. Uh, that's very kind. I love a dance. I love dancing. I want to go back. It's it's my plan to go back. Yeah. But but then it just became routine. And it's also an anxiety thing. Like working out is also who knows what came first? Like I need to work out or I feel like I'm slipping or I'm anxious and getting a little sweat at least relieves some of the anxiety. So yeah. now it's just like part of the routine. That's cool. And I'm a routine kind of guy. I'm hoping so. I'm or I'm moving into a place May 1st that has a gym. I'm hoping that's going to change everything. You're yeah. like, I'm here to be the it's gay always, man in your life. You always think it's going to be vicinity and it's never vicinity. <laughs> it is convenient. Yeah. But again, like I, I couldn't do gyms. I, I take really? classes. Yeah. And a lot of the classes, CrossFit's, you know, a lot of men, but a lot of classes that I take, I am one of the few men in the classes. If I go to a soul cycle, yeah. it's mostly women, me, one other guy. Dance was certainly a lot of women. Yoga, yoga is a mix, but it's, but I've always needed that class, if I go to a gym and I went through a phase where I just was at Planet Fitness or Blink, I mean, I would be walking around the gym yeah. on my phone, reading articles. I cannot force myself to really push myself on my own. I can't. Yeah. So I'm a big class boy, class pass. <laughs> if you're looking that. for classes, classes are fun. Classes are fun. I used to like going to bar classes. Yeah, bar can be cool. Bar is fun. Bar, that's definitely ladies. It is, that, that, that is, that is that's pure. A little, that's I'm like, like a looking for the two. weight for me. It's like this little two pound hot pink weight. I'm like, okay, we'll do this, but I, nothing's changing here. <laughs> they really, yeah. They, they, uh, they push you though in that class. I feel like they do in every class, but. It's all fucked up. And we live in an industry where like. That's the worst part. There's a degree where like, I think there can be an argument to be made that the more in shape one is, depending on the line, obviously, which, which side of the aisle, but like, but like, look at Kumail. Yeah. <laughs> I, Kumail's not doing this for no reason. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe he wanted to be that thing, but like that kind of, that's a deep lifestyle change. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. What he looks like now. I mean, and it's now he's a movie star. I mean, it's He's a movie star. It is true. He that did take him over to the next level in a lot of ways. Yeah. What is your do you so you still you've acted in stuff recently. You were in Hustlers. The one I month. wish that was recent. That was pre-COVID. Really? Pre-COVID. I love the way you say what's the uh, of less famous people on on Netflix is bonding. That was yeah. pre-COVID? Well, that was the the bond bonding, it was for a French streaming site. I believe it was called Black Pill. Okay. So it was like a nothing. Okay. I mean, it was cool. Yeah. And and uh I I played the host at this comedy club. It was filling up Broadway Comedy Club in the basement. And I got paid, I think, $150 a day for two days. And then Netflix bought it. Nice. And it was like on Netflix, but 
no pay change. And, uh, it got like, it got seen by a lot of people, but it was, that that was the only reason I got that role was because it was for like some shitty little Something streamer. Else. So less actors auditioning. What is, so I feel like a lot of the times, like I see you, you're writing, like you're one of those people, you yeah. always have your laptop and I'm like, I'm so excited to have you here so I can finally ask, what are you doing on there? Just, just like porn. what? what just are- looking at porn <laughs> and uh, favoriting <laughs> links and typing comments on the porn of, of- <laughs> Of, of just flaws in the performer's bodies. Uh, no, I, I think it's because of my, I think it's because I came up to stand-up comedy from the acting background mm-hmm. that I like writing things out. Yeah. Uh, I like to put in what changes I made. I, my memory is not fantastic. So I still listen back to almost every set. Wow. And I put in those little changes. I put in lines of what I'd like to try. And I've always, and this could be the ADD where I've always had trouble, like just like, it would be more useful to me if I had the tightest hour in the world. Instead, I have four hours and some parts are really tight and some parts still need work. So I just like, I, I need to get it out there and I need to keep track of it. And before I go do an hour now, I go through the, one of the documents, which is the stuff that's kind of there. And I write down on a napkin, what am I going to do that night? And it's, it's, it's overly laborious. It's a lot of, sometimes it feels like, is this just busy work to make it feel like I'm working? And it's a mix. Yeah, I think it has made it. So I've made some really good bits, but I also, sometimes I'm like, I have four different word documents now, hundreds of pages each that I'm combing through. And this is what I'm doing instead of forming meaningful connections with other comedians and having life experiences to actually write about. That's a cynical take of it. But but that's what I'm writing. It's just like, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm doing a festival this week and it's short sets. And so now earlier today, I like look through the big document. I pull out the bits I really want to work on. And then I'm trying to write and what changes am I going to try tonight? So I'll be set for the festival. And it's, a, it's, it's just a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. And as I try to do other things on top of stand up, it's hard because I could just do stand up. Right. I could just do stand up. And unfortunately you have to do other things to make it. What other things are you focusing on? So, I mean, I'm auditioning here and there. Yeah. Uh, doing like a TV show pitch and meeting with people who, you know, I, I did JFL and and it went well. And it's, it's just crazy because people just saw six minutes of me. Yeah. And now they're like, so let's talk about a full TV show. And you're like, I have, you don't know me that well, Uh, but that's just how it works. You have this heat, you have this buzz. And so, you know, you pitch these shows and, and hopefully I feel like I would want to work with someone else to write a full script. I I have written scripts before, but again, I, I love standup because I can bounce around and I never have to rein in my lack of focus. And a script feels like torture to me. It's torturous. Um, So pitching TV shows, uh, acting here and there, my podcast, The Downside. Yeah. But I really just want to keep the stand-up strong. I think the reason I left acting is is because I was like, oh, I don't think I can be great at this. I could do it. Mm-hmm. I think, I think, you know, it's possible to to. I could have gotten on a on a, a serial drama and been fine, but. But I feel like with stand-up, I'm like, oh, this is what my skills lend itself to. Yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome, but it is a tough, it's a tough life. It is a tough, so, okay, I, I like to ask the best advice you ever received. What would that be for you? It doesn't have to be stand-up related. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the best advice, I don't know the exact, like, it wasn't exactly in words, but I was at a musical theater camp in uh, in high school and there was like a pianist who he had played in Broadway at some point. And at that, you know, at that level, that was like, like God had visited earth and he he was teaching class and he was, he was harsh, but smart. And he would let at one point during the camp, you could come 30 minutes early and he would run through a song with you. And I like, you know, just the alarm went off and I kind of slept in and I was shaving and I must've been like 15 or 16, but I, I, I got there late like five minutes late, six minutes late. And he reamed me out so bad. And then, then we got to this song and it was, it was uh, uh, something's coming from West Side Story and it was too high for me. 
So as the students were coming in for class, he was making me continue to run it. And I was just cracking in front of all these, all my peers after being late. And I felt so, so much shame. And then at the end of this, then he went into the class and at the end he gave me some, he gave me some kind of wink or some kind of nod being like, he saw that I was, that I was, that I had learned my lesson. And for me, it was that lesson of, of, uh, not just being on time because I was late to this, <laughs> but but it's just about like to me it was moments like that of you're either like taking this seriously or or you're not, and you can't expect uh, others to to join you if you're not going to take it seriously. So like I took his his time for granted if, as a 15 year old kid, a like 60 something year old Broadway uh, pianist, and I just was like I'm going to be late and. I just was humbled in that moment in a way that it's, it's tough as you, as you get older, it's you, you, I I feel like I don't have too many people that I look up to in a pure way. Everyone has their own, uh, goals and, and their own, um, purposes. So you don't always trust what they're telling you. But in that moment, it was like, this was a teacher who was just trying to teach me a lesson and he was doing it the way that maybe toxically, but I, I, my father was a yeller. And I think there is a part of me that does respect someone yelling at me if their intention is to help me. Cause Mm -hmm. for me, that's just like an emotional language. I do understand for better or for worse. I like yelly teachers. I like I like a lot of those toxic teachers that that have adversely affected some people's lives and fucked them up. Those to me were were my favorite teachers. Why? I think partly because that's just the love language I got from my father. Like we he would yell and then sometimes I would yell back and then he would yell from a deeper pain than I could imagine <laughs> from his fucked up childhood and then I would cry and then we'd hug. And it's like again, this is not this is not an advertisement for this kind of behavior. Yeah. But uh, something about it was 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 when someone cared enough that they like were willing to go above and beyond to get through to you. Right. And it, I, I think it's tough because people abuse it. And I, there's yellers who are abusive. But like sometimes I, I think about friends who, let's say you have a friend who won't go to the doctor. Or, or, you know, I, I have a friend who drinks a, a, a fair amount mm-hmm. and went to their doctor and, you know, didn't, told them they didn't drink. And when they told this to me, it's, it's like, well, what do you do? What do you do? And part of it's like, yell, you got to yell. You got to shake this person. You can't hit them. But, but like, you, but it's like, you are not, uh, you're not taking care of yourself. And there's something about it that I, that I admire. And I don't really know how to synthesize it. I don't think I yell at too many like strangers, <laughs> but there's something that for me, if someone's yelling at me, yeah. uh, I have a good uh, friend of mine named Chris and it sounds like his father was like a yeller too. And we have gone into some fights where we're on the phone, like, fuck you, like wow. just full. And, and he's Italian too. <laughs> and maybe that's part of it. But, but it never ended our friendship because we know what that is. Yes. And again, I don't know what to do with it, but it is a, it is a language I respect and I miss stand-up comedy is so independent where no one really gives you true feedback. Maybe you can ask for it, but you're on your own. You have to decipher things for your own. And certainly no one's yelling you at you. And then you get, you get representation and you get network people and all these people. And they're all, they're all just flattering you all the time. They're either flattering you or they're just not answering your calls. And you, you, you miss sometimes. I miss a director being like, what the fuck was that? You didn't fucking, you need to go. You need to do this. You need to figure out that you, 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 you crapped out here. And I, I miss that because it meant that that person was really looking out for you. And, and wasn't just trying to avoid the conflict. I, I completely, I get that. I, I feel like my father also yelled at so much yeah. and like cr- crazy. And I feel that for a while I mistook like any type of attention for love. Uh-huh, like, uh-huh. And I think in my life, I've been with a lot of men that are very angry. Yeah. And I've been like, 
okay, well, but I grew up knowing that a man can treat you this way and still love you because my dad, he would get very angry at me. Sure. Then he'd go to his room and then he'd come back and cry asking for forgiveness. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a it toxic. It seems like a very common, like because the, my therapist once said like that meant like that meant that that emotion mattered to him more than you in that moment. And I always think about that whenever I get really angry because of course, like I do now. Like, of course. And and I know that like when I'm giving attention to an emotion, I'm saying like this emotion means more than the person that. Yeah. I, uh, for me, like my, my dad would yell at people. I mean, he didn't have any shame, which I have. Like there, there's some <laughs> people who I like, I, I very rarely yell at a person, but I will yell at like to the sky. I will yell if a printer's jam, like I will just, I'll scream, fuck, fuck. I'll do it to the sky. And it's, it's obviously scary for people and I understand it. And then that's, that's part of why I had to rein it in because if I'm on the train and the tr if I was going to a spot mm -hmm. and the train just stops and then it, you know, I, I breathe for two minutes and then it fucking rises in me. And then it's like five minutes, 10 minutes. And I'm just like, fuck, fuck. And I get so, and I, I don't know if I like took what my father had and I was like, well, at least I'm not going to inflict it onto people. I'm just going to like <laughs> do it to the sky. <laughs> and it's, 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 <sighs> I don't know what to do with it. One time I was going to my therapist and the road was closed for some reason. They were doing some kind of construction, but there were cops. And this is also an example of like white privilege too. But I, I went there and like the cop was like, you have to prove that you live here in order to go under the caution tape and go to the house. I said, I, my therapist is here. And they're like, sorry, can't do. And I like turned around from the officers. And I went around, I was like, fuck, God fucking damn it. What the fuck? Shh motherfucker fuck and I turned to my right and my therapist was standing there because she had come out oh, to no. escort me to the offices and it it was like it was good that she got to see it so therapists so rarely get to really see you in the I wild I know you got to, she got to see you in action and <laughs> I feel like I'm a I'm better than when I was then but that's how it how it goes and again yeah. for me that's also like Looking back on it, it's such a deep white privilege thing because I just spoke to these police officers and then threw a hissy fit. And, but my father, he would be yelling at the officers. And I hated that. I hated that as a kid. He, uh, uh, there was one time we were at a restaurant and some woman, she, I mean, she was very obnoxious what she was doing, but my dad was depressed as he was. And she said to him like, something religious, something like when you get to heaven, Jesus is not going to want to know about why you're depressed. Something batshit crazy. And my dad turned to her and said, you know what? Fuck you. And like double middle fingers in the middle of a nice restaurant. Yeah. And so many moments in my life where I was just a little kid, like, oh, can we just leave? This is so uncomfortable. The shame that you feel for someone else is like. And that's why I can rarely yell at people. Sometimes I like it when they yell at me first because it feels like I've been granted permission yeah. to let out the beast. But <laughs> I, I'm not very confrontational. And my father, like just, he didn't have that at all. He didn't care. I, I feel so much anxiety for how I'm making the other person feel. And my father had none of that. Yeah. And I knew how awful it was to stand next to that and be associated with that and feel the shame. And him being like, you know, why are you getting upset? I'm yelling at this person. You're not involved. And I'm like, yeah. I'm your son. I literally look like you right now. I'm stuck. I, I had a, uh, I had like an ex that would yell that way and he would yell at other people and it would make me so uncomfortable. And like, I tried to explain that, like, it doesn't matter if you're yelling at me, yeah. like you're still acting this way. And I mean, I, my dad, like going to a restaurant with him was an adventure because not only was he a yeller, he was allergic to, until my parents got divorced, he was allergic to- The allergies to, went away after the divorce? Uh, <laughs> he would make the waiter come over and uh -huh. bring a notebook and it would be onions, garlic, scallions, leeks, white pepper, black pepper, cucumber, and sesame seeds. That's a brutal. My girlfriend's <laughs> allergic to a lot of things. That's worse than than. But he can eat them now. That's what's crazy. I. So you think he just didn't like them? I think my mom thinks that maybe they irritated his stomach or something. But he does eat them now. Like he, when I was black a kid, pepper. Yeah, when I was a kid, we didn't have pizza because he was like the tomato sauce, the, has garlic in it. 
So we wouldn't, I'd never go to a pizza place with my dad, but now he'll like go to a pizza place and have a slice of pizza. Have you ever confronted him on it? What does he say? What does he say? No, he's the one that brought it up to me. He gave me a call and he was like, so Nelly, you wouldn't believe this. I've been introducing garlic back into my life and I'm good. That's infuriating. (laughs) That's infuriating. I... I have never figured out how to, I figured out how to joke about, uh, one, I have one new joke about how my daddy also like the biggest fights would be when he had to shit. Like there were so many times, like I'm in the car with like my mom, my dad in the back seat, And like when his bowels went, like that was his anxiety. So we almost got into like car accidents. Cause he's like, yeah. pull over. I have to shit. Like crazy. I, I It's so funny. Cause your mom's the Jew, right? <laughs> I mean, truly, your dad is exhibiting all allergies, gastrointestinal problems. Yeah. Oh, my God. We'd have Passover seders. He'd be like, I'm not, wait, everyone's reading and not eating. And he has a full fucking plate of like chicken. And it's like. This is a tough dad. I, I can, <laughs> But I will tell you that now that my dad's older and whether his testosterone is lower or he's just too tired to get angry as much. I really do see how it was anxiety that the anger was fueled by anxiety and not like, and he never hit, he never hit, he never punched a hole through the drywall. Like it never became violent. But I think when I reflect on my own anger and look at his, I go like, oh, this was like, you were anxious. Yeah. You were anxious and you were lashing out and you know, you made it impossible for anyone to soothe you. Who wants to soothe this kind of fucking asshole yelling everywhere? Right. But that's what it was. Cause I still see the anxiety, but now it's, it's like, it's weaker. It's more timid. It doesn't have the strength to lash out. Yeah. And it's, it's sad. It's, it is. It's a freak out. Like there is, there is a, we ordered in and I have a stepmom. So the, my, this food came and it had stuff on it that he didn't like. And he was yeah. like, oh, oh. and then she just like took it off and she's like, it's okay. But it is like, you feel like the small, it's funny because now that like, I've been learning about ultra running and stuff, it is, there's a lot of talk about like, kind of like mental strength and it yeah. it's, it's mental weakness to be able to get to that place as quickly as people do. Yeah. 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 And myself sometimes. Have you forgiven your dad? I would say, I mean, yeah, I'm like, I'm seeing him tomorrow. That's good. But I think I, moments when my life wasn't going well is when I would be particularly angry. Yeah. I'm like, this is because of my upbringing. When that's not, it's, I remember someone once said to me, like at a certain point, you need to take responsibility for who you are and not, and not blame your parents. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I think I, I think just looking back, I'm like, oh, my father was so depressed. And so, because I went back and forth. When did your parents get divorced? How old um, were you? Uh, well, so we lived together and they were separated since I was in fifth grade. And How long did that last that Until phase? I was a senior in high school. And but was and it a financial thing? Week. that No, they did it was like a, it was kind of like a, we both don't want to be away from you. Would they, would you all have dinner together? Sometimes. Was it tense? Was it like, or what, were they just like, we're not together anymore, but we're, we're no, I would be like, fine. I would be, I would beg them. I'd be like, get a divorce. I hate this. Yeah. But whatever. That's a long, you're the only child. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. You wish, do you wish you had gone back and forth when you look back on it? Hmm. Um, I think, yes. I think growing up without people yelling at each other probably would So they were yelling at each other throughout, like all the time. Yeah. I feel like if I didn't have that, then I might not be doing stand up. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> no, but I might be, uh, I don't know, might be more whatever. Yeah, you might be doing Thoroughly Modern Millie I, on that's Broadway. That's the thing. I feel that I love theater. <laughs> Doing the same thing every night, it, yes. it feels really boring. I did it when I did my play. It was it was the same show for a month, and I was like, "Oh, I don't think I have the temperament to do this." I would get so bored. Yeah. I would want to fuck around with something so bad. It's funny though because so I think like this. I have always had this like love for live performance as a kid. I was like afraid of anyone wearing a mask. 
like for some reason, but I went to, my mom took me to see 42nd street when I was like seven years old and I was terrified. I was like sitting there terrified. And the first scene is they just lift up the curtains and it's tap dancing. Uh-huh. And my mom goes, Nelly, look, look, it's just feet. It's just tap dancing. And I just remember that moment of turning around and being like, ah, oh, it's just dancing. And like, I've just, that was the first place I saw it. Second was Stoly Modern Millie, which I've seen a few times. And yeah. that was like, from then on, I just like loved Are you theater. still seeing theater? I haven't, I haven't seen I don't think I've seen it. I think maybe I've seen one thing since COVID, but not yeah, yeah, yeah. not much. Yeah. Yeah. It's really wasted on New Yorkers. We don't go. It's just that like when you see that, like when you see that that person is able to give their energy to every single person in that room and like the way that unifies everyone, it's just like a very exciting feeling. Yeah. I still get it. I saw Shocked, which is a musical. It's It's very cheesy. But it, you still felt it. I still felt like the magic yeah. of the full theater. Yeah. Do you feel like you tap into that with stand up? Uh, yeah. When stand up, when it's going well, and it's just one of those things when it's like it's when it's. I was uh, just at Doctor Grin's in Grand. And you Rapids, did an hour Michigan. and a half. I, I tried it if I can. Sometimes these days, I'd say hour fifteen. Someone is Someone in the my average. Twitch stream, I was like, I have John Marco on my podcast, and they're like, I just saw him do an hour and a half on Tuesday. He killed. Oh yeah. Oh, was he in Portland? So I was like, oh, did I see yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. You didn't know why? Um, <laughs> no, Portland, yeah. I, I, I'll do an hour and a half if it's a hot audience. But, but it, you know, I was in Grand Rapids and there's literally a club underneath the, like a dance club underneath the comedy club. Uh, and so for the second show, I mean, from the beginning of the show, p- pounding music, pounding music. And there's, you really go through it all. I, I just have shows that are real work, I was in Alabama and it was like, this is work. I am yeah. working hard. I do not feel good. <laughs> I, it's just, it's, it feels lab- laborious. And then other times where it feels like heaven. But I enjoy, I think I really get off on the, whatever the dopamine release of working on a new joke. And then that first time it works. Yes. And going like, yes, I figured it out. Yes. And okay, I, I have only a few minutes left and I forgot my tarot decks. I usually pull a tarot deck at the oh, end, yes. so you're lucky. Um, but what like inspires you to write? Like, how do you, I feel like you are always coming up with new material. Like, what is that process for you? Do you like sit down and free write or do you just kind of like get a premise? Do you write on stage? What is that I wouldn't say like? I write on stage. Like I, I hope to get to a place where once, once in a blue moon, something happens on stage that becomes a bit, but I could not count on that. I think I just have ideas uh, uh, throughout the day. And especially when I'm stoned, I think everything's funnier to me. So, and 90% of it, I throw out. When I'm stoned, I always yeah. go on my phone and I write down little things. When I talk to my girlfriend, uh, Tova, I find just the conversation so stimulating, just little ideas pop in. And then later I try to see if I can bring out whatever was funny inside my head. I know a lot of like- That's so nice. That your conversation with your girlfriend so stimulating, it inspires you. Yeah, but it can be annoying to her because there's a lot of conversations where I'm like, wait one second, wait one second. And then I type <laughs> it in. And she'll, sometimes once in a while she'll be like, okay, yeah. can we that, that be the last note for the night? <laughs> and it never like, is. Babe, you don't understand. It's a compliment. You inspire me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> well, the first piece, of, I got her a piece of jewelry and uh, uh, it says, uh, comedy muse and it's like a, it's a it's a but it's like an old greek god it's like the muse of comedy or something oh so so uh yeah i just i think i go throughout the day and i think of a funny thing and i think a lot of stand-up comedy is just like okay i know what's funny in here how do i put it into words in a way where whatever is funny inside me immediately becomes funny to them yeah with the punchline but i think like a lot of it is like when i was a kid at both houses I would dance in the living room with my parents, just putting on music like disco. And I had this urge of like, I want people to watch me. I had this urge from the beginning. Yeah. Maybe it's because of the divorce, lack of attention, who knows. But I, I told them, I was like, can we, we have to get our living room on a stage so people can watch me. And I think sometimes stand up, <laughs> it's, it's the closest I could get to that because I, I have a sense of humor But part of it is like, how do I make myself uh, worthy of people's attention and I get to be myself on stage and have people watch me? And I'm not saying it's healthy. I'm not saying it's not healthy. I'm just saying it's who I am and I want to earn 
the attention, but I love the attention. And I, and I want it to be earned. I want to feel like you're giving it to me because I have, I have given you something that makes you laugh. And it's, you know, it's, it's all, I just think recently about how, how making someone laugh and making someone come is a similar thing. Yeah. It's, it's like you, you're making them, you, made them feel this, this thing and you see their, their reaction to it. And it's something about it is so you feel powerful, you feel wanted, you feel needed. You feel like in that moment, all they want is you. And I think that's like what, what the, I, I, just even the motion of someone losing and laughing and someone coming, it's a very similar thing. And, uh, that's, that's why, that's why it's amazing. That's why stand up and, and getting someone to laugh is incredible. I love that. What do you, here's my last, my last question sure. for you. I feel like I, I could keep this conversation going, but what is, what do you wish you knew before you started stand up? Like what's just one thing, if you could give like your self advice when you started? Other than starting earlier, <laughs> which is a big one because, because things take so much time. Things take so much, it takes, you cannot, no matter how good you are, you cannot speed up relationships. And I think the advice I'd have is kind of the same advice that I try to give myself now. And that, that Tova always gives me where it's just like embracing the, the community, getting to know people, trying to watch other people's work because it enriches you. This is like a, a communal thing we all that that would be that would be part of it it's it's just like fostering relationships mm-hmm. i think like i'm a workaholic and even when i was doing musical theater or i was acting i was just like i'm going to be the fucking best at this thing i'm going to work so fucking hard and i'm 34 now and especially on the road there's times where you're like the loneliness of this is so unbearable it's so excruciating that I can't just work until I'm astounding. And, yeah. and, uh, like I'm going to break, I'm going to break. And, and you get to a point where you're like, I'm going to die someday <laughs> and I need to enjoy some of this. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's, that's kind of part of it. I don't think I would have listened to myself, Yeah. you know? So I think the other piece of advice I would have given me would just be like, really get that super tight five. <laughs> like, I know you want to write an hour, but like, just do that killer tight five and, and, and focus on being just insanely good with that tight five. That and is, you'll have time to expand later. That's cool. I like that. But again, I'm still, that's a lesson I could get now. I could say to myself now, get that tight hour. Yeah. And you can do your five hour play later. <laughs> So I you are who you are. Five hours. I don't know if I actually probably, have five hours. But yeah. it, it, depends. it always depends on an audience. I had a bad audience. I got 20 minutes. It's true. Yeah. And then it's gone. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have five hours, but, but it's just like, it's hard. We don't have a system anymore. It used to be you, you work on this hour and then you put it on something and it, everyone sees it. Now it feels like you could, but it's no so, one's going to watch it. So is it burnt? So is it not? What's good enough? When do you let something go? When do you have a clip that will do well on Twitter? So you might as well do it now. Well, your late show, your late night set in your Comedy Central, there was no overlap at all. Yeah, and I, I know there, Yeah, yeah. If I do it now, I'm sure there'll be some overlap at some point, but- you know, again, it's like only comics would even know that. I, I no know, one really yeah. knows. Yeah. No one really knows. And sometimes you're like, well, did I burn that because I put it on YouTube? Because one person in the audience knew what it was? Yeah. So I don't I don't know what what the advice is. I, I think it's I, I learned from like it's just about writing. It's 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 always just challenging yourself to to make it better. Yeah. Even those jokes you think are done could be better. But I think I'm not the kind of guy that needs work advice. I'm the kind of guy that needs go outside. Same. And have have lunch with a friend of <laughs> Well, John Marco, thank you so much for being here. Where can people find you? They can find me everywhere at John Marco Cerezi. And my podcast is called The Downside with John Marco Cerezi. And it's a, it's a fun podcast. So check awesome. it out. Cool. Thanks for being here. For and uh, as always, you can find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Natalie Cuomo. Join the Patreon and we'll see you next week. Oh, also, sorry, I forgot my tarot deck. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>